In a mobile first economy, the seamlessness and the transparency of communications has made it so effortless that we fail to realize and understand the intricacy and complexity of what enables it. Connectivity to the internet has become the digital equivalence of a natural resource. Like a utility, we expect it to be there, we expect it to just work, and we suffer greatly when it is absent. To help you appreciate how this massive communication infrastructure is constructed, let me walk you through what happens every time you press that YouTube app icon on your cell phone. In this video, I will cover the life of a packet as it traverses from your fingertips through your cell phone and ultimately to the internet ether. Between your device and the internet sits the cellular communication network. It can be simplified into two major components. The first is RAN that is radio access network, and the second is core network. Let us dive deeper into each one of these. RAN stands for radio access network. Intuitively, without realizing, the cell towers which you see today is the most visible part of the RAN. The second part of the network, connecting from the RAN, is the core network. Think of it as a command center, providing overall telemetry, control, and regulation to the network. The main functions of the core network are user authentication, policy control enablement of network and network slices. The first destination of your cell phone signal is the radio access network. The radio access network is a conduit responsible for getting the data from the internet via the core network and transmitting it to the cell phone. Let us take an example of an image or video you are downloading. This image is provided to the RAN in form of IP packets. But before the data can be transmitted from the RAN, the data needs to be prepped a little bit. Let us take a look at what I mean by data preparation. The IP packet first enters the PDCP layer, responsible for ciphering, error compression, and sequencing. The journey of the packet across the rest of the network is determined here. The packet then goes through the MAC layers, which among other functions are responsible for scheduling, concatenating the data, and handling the padding aspects. In short, the MAC provides the flow control and multiplexing for the transmission medium. Finally, the data arrives at what we call the physical layer in form of transport blocks, where the packet is rate matched, encoded, and modulated. After this, the reference signal is inserted, beamforming coefficients are applied. So far, the data is all in frequency domain. Now we convert the data in time domain by doing inverse FFTs. At last, the data is finally converted into analog signals and processed by radio frequency circuits and transmitted at cellular frequency from the cellular tower. Now that we have traversed the entire radio access network chain, all this has been done historically by brute force, by hardware at each cellular tower. Only big boys with big toys could play in this sandbox. However, if we borrow one principle from the hyperscale cloud and think about disaggregating dedicated hardware from the software functions, we now can have baseband functions virtualized and become less dependent and less tied to the capabilities and performance at each cell tower. To accomplish this, more software-friendly architectures are needed. Another reason for the desire to disaggregate the RAN is market forces. The RAN market is a duopoly of two or three vendors providing entire stack hardware plus software. This verticalization not only creates a vendor lock-in, an imbalanced economic advantage, but also fundamentally stifles innovation. By virtualizing and disaggregating the RAN, we can create a more frictionless operating model. New vendors and domain experts now participate with innovative solutions for the stack. The entire RAN stack becomes open and interoperable, and telco operators can now write down the cost and power curve. Four to five years ago, Open RAN was formed as telco operators and carriers grew frustrated with the lack of innovation in a highly concentrated closed ecosystem burdened with high equipment costs. ORAN was instrumental in driving three major wedges. It decouples hardware software dependencies, meaning there's a vertical split. It recommended various split options for disaggregating the RAN, meaning there is a more virtualized network. It standardizes interfaces, meaning each component can interoperate with other vendor components as long as it follows the standard, thereby removing vendor lock-in. 
Now let us see how this entire stack can be disaggregated. Various options are shown here. As we move to the option closer to RF, the front hall rates become prohibitive and very large. As we move the options closer to the core network, the front hall rates become manageable. With the split 7.2 and split F1, the RAN has been disaggregated into three principal hardware silos. The RU, that is radio unit, DU, that is distributed unit, and central unit. RU performs RF and lower phi functions, DU performs upper phi functions, and the CU performs PDCP and upper functions. The idea is for the RU to be super low power, low cost, and light, such that it can be mounted on a pole or a roof. DU, on the other hand, does most of the heavy lifting on the phi functions, and therefore costs more, consumes more power as compared to RU. By virtualizing baseband functions, a DU can now be connected to multiple RUs for achieving high parallelism. One of the more popular split options is split 7.2. Now that you have understood the concept of RU, DU, CU, let us take a look at the entire network again. There are various topologies available for the placement of RU, DU, and CU. RU and DU both can be at cell site, or there can be a virtualized DU at the pre-aggregation node, connected to multiple RUs. The decision to pick one of these options is based on fiber availability, real estate, TCO, operational preference, front hall rates, user density, workloads, etc. The key is mobile operator need the flexibility to pick and choose different splits based on same of the shelf hardware network components by using different software implementations. Different protocol layers will reside in different components based on front hall availability and deployment scenarios. This approach will reduce the cost and operation of the TCO for mobile operators. The lightweight and low power RU enabled by Split 702 is more suitable for better coverage in large dense environment by enabling shared cell architecture. However, higher split options like Split 2 or 5 are better suited for areas where front hall routing options are limited. So far, we have looked at how the packet travels through the radio access network. Now let us look at the next leg of the packet journey and focus on 5G core network. The core network is the central element of a network that provides services to the customers who are connected by the access network. Think of it as a command center or the traffic control center. The core network consists of a user plane function, a control plane function, and few other functions. 5G core networks follow service-based architecture in which functions have been virtualized. This is known as network function virtualization. Control plane functions typically include, include AMF, access mobility function. This function is responsible for user authentication, mobility management like reachability, idle active mode handling, and NAS signaling with your device. SMF or session management function is responsible for session and control of the user plane function device, IP address, allocation, and management. Other control functions are NSSF, network slice selection function. You might have heard of network slicing. This is the function responsible for that. NEF is network exposure function. This provides security for services accessing 5G core nodes. Network repository function, providing profiles for network function instances and support services. UDC, Unified Data Convergence. This is responsible for storing and managing subscriber information, processing policy control function, and authentication server function, AUSF. The other principal part of the core network is the user plane. User plane function is responsible for packet routing and forwarding, packet inspection, PCC rule enforcement, lawful intercept collection, roaming interface, traffic counting, reporting, etc. One essential quality of user plane function is also to allow numerous configuration which are essential for traffic needs, for example, latency reduction. Keep in mind that the data which you are downloading, that image in our previous example, goes through the user plane function. Control plane function, as described before, is for controlling policy management and controlling of the network. Naturally, you may be wondering where all these functions of the core network run in real life. Control function, like any other function, 
needs to be managed, configured, and orchestrated. This needs to be done in a dynamic, frictionless, and virtualized way. To solve this, we need an environment that is microservices or function-driven. We need an environment of pooled resources that can be spun off and spun down. Naturally, public cloud like Amazon EC2 becomes a natural candidate. Rather than reinventing the wheel, we can use cloud-native technologies like Kubernetes or Docker. For the user plane function, since the data rate is so high, this is realized mostly using traditional router technologies supplied, for example, from Cisco or Juniper. Now that we have unpacked the entire communication network, let's reassemble everything in a holistic context. From the time you press that YouTube button to first images is nearly instantaneous. We have taken a simple service protocol, your YouTube video, across an entire mobile network chain. Now imagine that video or IP packet of yours has traversed over 100 km in one hundredth of a second. The distance from your phone to the nearest RU can be a few kilometers. This, there can be tens of thousands of cell towers and latency is typically between half a millisecond to 10 milliseconds in 5G. Within a RAN, RU, DU, and CU, the distance can be 20 to 50 kilometers with thousands of pre-aggregation nodes and hundreds of aggregation nodes. The latency is typically less than 5 milliseconds. RAN to the core network through backhaul the distance is typically 40 to 200 kilometers. There can be tens of regional data centers. The latency is less than 10 milliseconds. Net-net, 5G can provide up to more than 10 gigabit per second of data with an uplink or downlink latency of less than 10 milliseconds, over hundreds of kilometers. All this for a seamless experience of your favorite YouTube video. The world that I've just described is the world that is. It doesn't prescribe of a world that will be. In the next 10 years, we envision a Cambrian explosion of endpoint devices. We envision the radio access network to be more heavily burdened. We envision a lighter RAM, where software applications drive the hardware. We envision the cloud migrating to the RAM and even closer to the edge. This now becomes the question, where is the edge in all of this? I will cover this in my next video. Until next time, from the edge.